So it's awareness and acceptance. So it's like being aware that people have challenges. That's great. But accepting that they may not do it the same way as you, and that's okay too. That's a hard one. Welcome back to our video storytelling for community engagement podcast. Today, I talk with the participants in our Invisible in the Hills pilot episode that we produced for Stories for Caregivers, funded by TELUS Fund, and we celebrate Autism Awareness Month. We chat with Vivian, the parent and primary caregiver for her autistic son, Solomon, Brianne from Fiddlehead Care Farm that offers therapeutic support and where Solomon spends his summer camp time and Jane from the Ontario Caregiver Organization that is our expert support for this project. When you have a project with TELUS in healthcare, you have to have some kind of expert support. Um, I guess just to make sure you aren't inventing these ideas yourself or spreading <laughs> this information. Um, so it's very nice of Jane and her organization to give us that support. And Jane, I'll just briefly, briefly introduce you to Brianne. I don't know if you've met Brianne, but Brianne is with the Fiddlehead Care Farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't met. It's surprising we haven't, but we haven't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I learned about your farm on the video. So. Yeah, you yeah. got to see a few of our friends there. and <laughs> Looks lovely. And we also have Vivian with us. So Vivian is the parent of Solomon and she is the primary caregiver. Um, so she is featuring um, very prominently in our video. It's really Vivian's story and her family's story that we were showcasing. Maybe we'll just start with Vivian. Um, Vivian, do you want to give us some of your thoughts on how the storytelling process was for you and, you know, how it feels? A lot of people are nervous going on camera or sharing their own personal story. Um, but, but, you know, you and your husband were really good at um, describing your feelings and your challenges. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about what you thought about explaining your situation? Uh, I thought, first of all, I really liked you guys. You guys are really easy to deal with. Um, I didn't feel un at, you know, at any time at unease because um, I know it's a lot of the questions. They were, some of them were challenging. They truly were. But I never felt, you know, uneasy about answering questions. As I say, like, I, I like to tell others. I like to help others. And this is part of how you help others is that, Sometimes somebody has to step up and be the one to speak up because nobody knows unless somebody is the first, the voice out there. I think that's, I think that was one of like the really important things and everybody I'm talking to, that's what's resonating with them. They're like, you're, you're so brave to step up to, you know, to talk because I feel uncomfortable. I don't want to. I said, well, this is, this is what I'm trying to do. Nobody can be aware if they don't know there's a problem. Yeah, and I've had that too because I've had some um, some caregivers that maybe I know like on a personal level and when I asked them initially if they wanted to participate or think about participating, you know, they weren't so sure. They were a bit uh, insecure with uh, sharing their own family situations. Um, but now that the video has been out there for a little while um, and they've, you know, they've been able to see what kind of um, an impact it has or at least, um, you know, see and validate themselves and their struggles. Um, they've, you know, people have reached out and said, you know, okay, I am willing to participate. If you want to do another one, I'll be very happy to share my story. Um, but Vivian, I was wondering, like, what other kind of feedback did you get from people in your circle of caregivers? Or, um, you know, I know you have a, a good network with other um, parents of autistic children. Um, what, what kind of comments have you had from them, if any? Well, a lot of them, I guess, were surprised that I talked about my family background and the kind of, uh, I'm going to call them almost prejudices in a way that people have towards people who are disabled. They were like, they were surprised that I was willing to step out. And I know even James himself was surprised that I was willing to mention the fact. But I mean, like, in my family, Solomon is not the only one with a disability. I have a cousin who's disabled. And when I said, when I said what I said, like, literally this cousin, she lives in another country, but I don't know much about her because her parents keep her sheltered because they're concerned, because they're scared, because, because of the different. That's what it is. So 
Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's very related to what I was going to ask about um, autism awareness and autism acceptance, because I know it's autism awareness month. Um, and, you know, some people don't really want to use the word awareness. They want to use the word acceptance. Um, I don't know if this is something like maybe you or Jane want to uh, join in on, on this. Um, what do you think about, you know, the difference between awareness and acceptance? Okay, awareness is always the first step. Yes, we should be aware, but that's great. I mean, it's the same way you should be aware that you should have um, carbon monoxide detectors in your home. Yes, you should be aware of these things. But then again, having an escape plan out of your house is also an important part of it. So it's awareness and acceptance. So it's like being aware that people have challenges. That's great. But accepting that they may not do it the same way as you, and that's okay too. That, that that's a hard one. And I've, I've struggled with that many times because if you have to explain to somebody who doesn't know, they'll tell you this, they'll tell you that, they'll tell you the other until you're just like, okay, you don't understand. So here are some suggestions, maybe some things you might want to read. So maybe you might come to acceptance, I think. Mm -hmm. I think I'm the other big piece too is just that the more and more, even around the awareness, I think there's that idea that I've met or interacted with one person with autism. And so I know what autism is. And, and there just is such a large um, span. Uh, and that's based on, you know, genetics, the op opportunities that they've had, the way that um, the autism it, or neurodiversity sort of presents. Um, in their case, there's just so many different pieces. And so I think even the awareness piece, I totally agree with what Vivian's saying, but even just the awareness that the amount of people who have been, who are diagnosed with autism and the differing ways that it um, plays out in their lives and their families' lives are such um, an important piece. Um, and then the acceptance piece is, is not just accepting them with a bunch of caveats. It's accepting every person for who they are um, and what makes them unique and special um, rather than, okay, I accept you have autism and therefore I'm going to put you in this specific pot. And therefore it means, you know, like back to those biases and stuff, automatically assuming that you know what that means for that individual, for their family, for what we expect of them, for what they should be um, able to access and those type of things. So, you know, awareness and acceptance can mean they're big terms. They can mean so much. Yes. And with Ontario Caregiver Organization, obviously part of our mandate is to spread awareness about the needs of caregivers like Vivian and, and others, regardless of the type of condition someone has that they're caring for. And how do we you know, support those caregivers when they're in need. And, and many times there is that piece of acceptance in the caregiver themselves as well to, um, you know, aside from others accepting the person you're caregiving for is really looking inside and, and accepting the situation as it is and how the person you're caring for is how they want to be cared for, what you can and can't do or accomplish and and um and then coming to that place of acceptance you can start to care for yourself too and um and and feel less of an internal struggle there that that helps you even get the support you might be looking for mm -hmm. yeah and one of the things that I learned um you know throughout this production um is that you know the terminology is, is also it's very important you know like if you're talking about acceptance or awareness you know it, it's a different thing it's a different mindset um similarly with um children who are autistic um there's you know some some parents prefer autistic children or children living with autism you know all of the terminology is so um it's so foreign to people who haven't been exposed to it or um you know know someone going through it um similarly with the high functioning and and low functioning or high support low support um i think those you know the kind of the vocabulary that we use and and how we describe the situations um, is very important, not just for the awareness, but for the acceptance, because, you know, what I've come to learn is that, um, 
autistic children come in so many different so many different varieties that it's not fair to judge um, how much caregiving a parent has to give um, depending on what you can see from the child because you know the child might look like they can go through uh, go through their day day-to-day -day tasks but there's a lot of effort being made on on the child and on the, the caregiver um, that we don't see, you know. So I think, you know, the judging and the assumptions that people make, um, a lot of the time it comes down to the vocabulary that's being used or that's just being thrown around, you know. And, and that's that is something that I've learned through this process, um, especially through other caregivers who have reached out to me and and had these discussions on, you know, how, how do we describe the situation of the child and the parent? Um, so I, I wanted to go on to ask Brianne, um, or maybe ask Vivian and Brianne to talk about um, something that didn't get to be shared in the video, which was how Fiddlehead Care Farm was instrumental in helping Vivian with Solomon at school. Um, you know, we weren't able to include all of Vivian's stories in the video, um, but I thought it was really good that she was able to express that she, she was able to bring in um, the Fiddlehead Care Farm um, experience to the classroom and help the classroom teachers. So I don't know, Vivian, if you wanna start us off on, on what that was about. Well, yeah, um, in prior years, so every year, so um, just I guess in context, every year Solomon has an IEP, an individual education plan that's um, developed and implemented based on uh, his educational goals, but a lot, of, a lot of other goals too, pretty much goals across the board, how he does emotionally in school, how he does, edu you know, based on his education and everything. Um, this year I asked Fiddlehead to step in in that role. Previously, I had a support person from DCAFs, but she wasn't available this particular year. But um, Fiddlehead was really good because uh, Brianne and Steph, they both, they both come from a background where they've dealt with children like this for a very, very long time with autistic kids. And they see Solomon not in a classroom. They see him out doing things, seeing him be the leader, seeing him um, wanting to lead the game of hide and seek and uh, leading the everybody in the walk in the woods and all of those things. Like these are the things that they see him doing. And a lot of the things, goals that they said he wasn't meeting in school, he was happily meeting them at camp because the, because the ask was different. It wasn't show me what you know how to do. It's like, here, let's do it together. It's fun. Mm -hmm. Brianne, do you want to, do you want to elaborate on sure, that? Like, thank what, you. What do you see? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Vivian. And yes, we, um, I mean, it all really starts with Vivian being such an incredible advocate. Um, I can't express how much, uh, you know, we've seen that um, and how much that has played into our ability to, or our, our honor of seeing Solomon grow uh, throughout the year. So we were very happy to be invited to the IEP meeting. And I think we took two parts. One was, unfortunately, a lot of caregivers don't always feel like their voice is being heard um there and so we can kind of be that second person that's on that caregiver team on their team to say I agree with what Vivian's saying what are we going to do about that and and for whatever reason sometimes a therapist or counselor or a doctor or whatever there there's something about sometimes unfortunately their word um gets taken at a higher a higher uh, level, which is very unfortunate because we see caregivers as the experts in their children and we should be listening to them as the, the forefront. Um, the second piece was exactly what Vivian was talking about. We were we have seen such incredible things in Solomon and we were able to share some of those times when he was able to show incredible leadership or um, but it's really about presenting the opportunities in, in a way that is engaging, that is supportive, that isn't putting him on the spot. And I think the other part, um, which makes some of the testing at school quite hard, is it has to, they, they often feel it has to be very standardized. So telling the time has to be on a, on a piece of paper, on a worksheet, where he can tell the time very easily. Um, 
but it's not on a piece of paper. It's in a certain, you know, it's when, when is lunch and he knows how to do things or fractions talking about it on a, on a pie on the wall or a percentage of something versus some of the standardized tools. So I think we really were so excited to play a part in that in, in those two ways, helping to be kind of the advocate with mom and a secondary person saying we support who she is um, and what she does. And secondarily as a clinician, being able to say, here are some ways that, that have worked for us. Are there opportunities to include that um, in the classroom. And so I think we've had lots of opportunities when we're invited to be part of those meetings. Um, it's so important to have that wraparound support. Um, so every person that is part of that team, we shouldn't be separate from school and school shouldn't be separate from us in terms of information sharing. Mm -hmm, excellent. Yeah. Um, Brianne, would you like to tell us a little bit more about Fiddlehead Care Farm? Because I know it's the first of its kind um in Canada do you want to just elaborate on that a bit and tell us what is making it so unique and different sure so I'll, I'll try and be quick on this I have lots to say and um so it's myself Brian Mathers and I'm a certified child life specialist and a therapeutic recreation specialist and my business partner Stephanie Deacon who you see in in the video um her and her husband actually own the property um it's a 50 acre organic uh working organic farm um that we use for therapeutic means and so um we really provide therapeutic and clinical services to children and young adults using this animal assisted care farming model. So as Miranda, as you mentioned, um, the activities are built around care farming, which is really big in other countries. Um, uh, the UK, the Netherlands, Australia, places who are I would say a little ahead of us from a holistic health perspective and uh, care farming is just really a, it's an evidence-based practice about using farms and agriculture and natural landscapes for physical and mental health. Um, so well established in other countries, we have some incredible therapeutic farms in our area and in Ontario, things like equine therapy or horticultural therapy. What makes us unique is um, the therapists who pull all of that together. So we don't have equine therapy. We do small animal therapy. So you'll see in the in the in the wonderful documentary, we've got uh, chickens, uh, goats. Luna, the mini pig, who always is people's favorite. Um, and so we, uh, Stephanie and I both worked for many, many years in the um, uh, special needs sector, but really saw the power of animals in nature in really bringing out the best in us. So our tagline is uh, grow from within. And we're called Fiddlehead Care Farm because if anyone's ever seen a fiddlehead, they're all curled up and mm -hmm. they need the right attention, support, maybe nurturing and environment. And then they grow into incredible ferns and they were that fern was always there. They had everything inside of them that they needed to be their best selves. They just uh, and their unique self, they just needed the right environment. So we do everything from individual and family counseling to camp, which is what Solomon's been really involved in, um, life skills programming, really any opportunity to get kids and families back out into nature. And we just see such incredible benefits um, seeing each child and family for who they are and their unique strengths. Um, and so it's been just such an honor, as I said, to get to know Vivian and her family and to have Solomon back at camp. And we'll be having him back at camp again this summer. Um, and so we just look forward to seeing um, even more of, of that um, growth and support. And he just hops right out of the car and runs down the driveway and is ready, ready to go. And then at the end of the day, an important support that we do provide to families um, is always really incorporating them. So we provide an, um, I think for Vivian and David have said that a really big help has been that we give them a little synopsis, a personal synopsis to each family of the day and things that they can then take home and ask further questions about. So you know, the hide and seek is a perfect example. He is a master hider and seeker. And to be able to see him, it's an integrative camp. So to see him actively, equally playing hide and seek, doing being the hider and the seeker with children of all needs, 
up to the age of 18 and just being an equal participant. And then Vivian had expressed to us after, which was really neat, that she was able to talk to him about it. And he started playing it with his sister at home. So that ability to then, he enjoyed it there. He felt successful. He was able to kind of take that skill home, uh, show it to his, show it off to his family and feel a sense of mastery. And again, he was totally included in the program and, and um, just absolutely thrives. He is an absolute star. Um, and it's just always a pleasure to have him there. So that's great. That's that really is it's such a positive, um, such a positive solution that you have to these families. And you know, our video is based in rural parts of Ontario. Um, and that's, you know, that was our always our intention. Um, and it was really like a lovely kind of surprise to find this unique, beautiful solution that you have for the challenges that the families out in this area face. Um, Jane, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, I mean, if you, you know, if you're in contact with caregivers all over Ontario, do you see different types of unique situate, unique solutions like what um, Brianne is providing? Uh, yes, we do cover the entire province um, and we're fairly a young organization, we started to deliver information and uh, programming in very late 2019. And, and uh, just around the time the pandemic happened is when we um, started to offer some virtual programs and services on top of, of um, our helpline, uh, which again is, is a free, toll-free um, way to access any information programs or services that the Ontario Caregiver Organization offers. And um, for anyone who watches this video who's not familiar, um, that number, if I can give that out, because that helps people who don't even know where to start as a caregiver who is looking for some kind of support for themselves, um, that uh, they can um, access a, a representative who will help um, based on where they are living and what may be available in their area, whether it be a rural or, or a urban or suburban area, what might be available to them. So it's completely anonymous. You just provide, the, I think, the first three um, characters of your postal code and, and they work with you on that. Um, the phone number is 1-833-416-2273. And an easy way to end or to remember the last four numbers is it's also CARE. So um, 1 416 CARE. And that's a great way to start. Or if you find your way to our website, you can also chat with a representative there. Again, doesn't matter where you are in Ontario, who you're caring for. Um, and we have a variety of web based services. We have, um, again, because they're virtual, these are solutions that may help depend no matter where you live. Um, we have some support groups that meet online. We have one-to-one -one peer mentor uh, relationships that if that's an interest someone has, we can match you uh, to somebody who's maybe walked a similar walk to you and, um, and, and can match for up to six months, provide that ongoing, maybe weekly phone call to get the emotional support you may be looking for. Uh, we also have um, monthly webinars in, in English and French, so a variety of topics. And so sometimes like Vivian, you know, she's she's got a, her own specific type of caregiving situation in her family. Brianne, certain types of um, needs you see at Fiddlehead Care Farm. And so our webinars, because we don't wanna duplicate the services, other organizations that have those special skills and, and expertise in, we um, are trying to um, also look at what are some universal aspects of caregiving that we can, can help educate and provide support. And that is, you know, um, finding, you know, that self-compassion for the caregiver. We have a program called SCALE that really helps you manage the emotions of being a caregiver. And that program includes webinars as well as some counseling. So just a vast, a vast um, array of programs and services. And because they're virtual, 
to your question about are there special solutions in urban versus rural, we're trying to meet the needs of a lot of people, no matter where they are, all the while understanding that internet connection sometimes is a barrier or not, uh, you know, easy in some rural and in some not so rural areas as well. So we we try to um, work with other community based organizations that are in those communities as well to get access to to our programs and services to the people they serve. Mm -hmm. Yes, nice. I've actually been watching a few of your webinars just so that I'm a little more informed myself when I have to, you know, talk to caregivers and plan out, you know, what do we what do we want to talk about? Um, Yeah, they were very good. Oh, Um, that's great. Vivian, let's just touch on the rural and urban problems that we have, because, you know, we do have some rural challenges in Orangeville. Um, We didn't get to use, include all of them in your video, obviously. Um, But I know like the transportation is definitely one of the big challenges that we have um, in our area. If you don't have a car, as much as Orangeville is a very small town and you can get from one side to the other in 10 minutes in a car, um, when we're trying to do that by bus, it becomes a whole different situation. Solomon has to see his pediatrician every six months. And if you know the Orangeville area, you know that I live, I'll give an example, I live close to the police station and his doctor's office is close to the hospital. Yes, as Miranda says, under 10 minutes by car. But um, otherwise, it's a pretty much a he wouldn't go to school the day he had the appointment because I have to pull him because of the time it takes. It's um, two buses we have. So our buses run on the half an hour, every half an hour, not on Sundays, only on weekdays <laughs> up until like, I believe, 8 p.m. or something like that. So a weekday appointment would include if the appointment is at 10, I have to make sure I'm there by like. 930 because there's no guarantee if I catch the bus that would drop me there for 10 that I'd make it. So I'd start to take the first bus uh, to the changeover point and then hopefully the other bus is there and catch it. Now, if you miss the bus or something, that's why I always start out that extra half an hour early because you never know. Um, I think the day we did it, we actually happened to catch the buses right on time, but I've had times where They weren't there on time because of weather or delays or something else. So then um, it was a challenge. And during COVID, when the the doctor's office asked me if I wanted to come in, they're like, oh, you can come, you know, a little early and wait in your car. I go, well, we're going to have to do virtual visits or phone visits because I don't have a car. And I'm standing outside in the cold with my child in the midst of this like, I can't even go into a place to sit down to have a snack or something because everything was shut. So, yeah, yeah there's, the, there's those challenges. There's always those challenges. And um, furthermore, if there's any kind of services being rendered outside the community, my husband takes um, two weeks of his vacation time every year, which are off because those are the weeks for camp. Because I don't have a second car, we have to get Solomon there, which is pretty much like a school day. So it's like nine to three. So um, my husband takes that time off so we can shuttle Solomon back and forth to camp for those two weeks. Yeah, so, yeah. and there would be there would be no bus service to get you to the Fiddlehead Care Farm. Nope, definitely not. Yeah, definitely not. So. Yeah. And I thought it was also um, interesting that you said if you if you wanted to get him to a specialist at sick kids for, you know, different reasons, special pediatric dentist, um, that's going to take you the whole entire day just to get yourself, it's it's near impossible, to, I mean, not impossible, but you can do it with public transport, but it will be very challenging and very time consuming. And I can imagine very difficult to take Solomon on this big adventure on public transport. Um, you know, you'd have to take, you'd have to get David's car for the day. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of financial and time um, constraints and pressures put on families in uh, rural areas trying to access specialist services like that. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I think it's great that that David does take the time in the summer to get Solomon to the camp, but, you know, it's also a sacrifice of vacation time, right? Right. Yeah. Um, is there anything else, Vivian, that you wanted to tell us that we didn't get to put into the video? I think the biggest thing that uh, my husband and I, David, always talk about is the fact that people tend to see kids with autism and other disabilities. They see, tend to see it in a very clinical light. And that's not true in a way. 
looking at somebody purely clinically, because there's so many people I've talked to who are outside of the loop of autism who think it can be cured. We can cure it. Can you, can you feed them this special diet? Can you do this sort of chemical therapy? Uh, can you, you know, train them to be other ways? And people in this community will know what that means. There are many different ways that are very controversial. But I just like Solomon's a child. David talked about that very clearly. Solomon's a child. He's no different. He's not a burden. It's not a sacrifice. He's my child. He's what I would do for anybody. You know, it, it's my child. It doesn't matter that he's, he's different. But different from whom? Different from people who are not like him? What if, what if more people in the world were autistic than other? Then who would be different? I think the biggest thing that I want to take that everybody should take away is that, you know, we're all people. We should all have the same opportunities. I know that's not realistic, but I mean, that's the goal. That's the goal, that everybody has the same opportunity, that the caregivers get the support that they need, that the person with a disability gets the support that they need, that everybody gets a chance to show that they're capable, they're a person, and, you know, that they're, they're loved and respected. Yes, exactly. Um, do you want to tell us like briefly what you do for yourself? Because we didn't really get to include that. And, you know, self-care is really important. Um, maybe just tell us a little bit about your your library knitting project or the whole Oh, my, 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 all the other things that I do. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So um, I work with a group called Orange Threads in town. Uh, they're through the library. Yep. Um, every year we do a donation um, to Family Transition Place around Christmas, where last year was our first year to be able to do it again. So that's a lot of fun. Um, I'm also part of the Orangeville um, and District Court Society. So I am the secretary and the archivist and the photographer, and I run the Instagram too. I'm busy. Um, I also serve on my parent council from my school. I, I have a lot of things that keep me busy. Um, other than even working. I work evenings, uh, would skip the dishes because that's the time we can, I know we didn't get a chance to talk about that at all either, but my husband gets home and we do the switch off, you know, 10, 15 minutes to explain what's going on for the night and then we turn it over. Oh, and I think one other thing I'm gonna uh, just uh, talk about quickly was I've signed up and I'm starting tomorrow, a 12 week certification pro um, program to get an autism um, certificate through Carrie's place. So that starts tomorrow. Nice, so nice. I keep, I, I keep myself busy. Yeah, I'm glad that some of it is your own personal, um, you know, what brings you some joy um, and some self-care, yeah. yeah. All right, well, thanks everyone so much. We have about one minute before my Zoom is done. If anyone wants to add anything else. I just wanted to really thank Vivian and David and Miranda and James and the Art of Storytelling and of course TELUS Fund and all the other stories for caregivers. It was just such a joy to be a part of. And I think the video came out very authentic, telling the story. Uh, it wasn't, you know, woe is me, which is not Vivian anyway. She's a great advocate, um, but it showed the reality. And so I just really want to thank you for that because I think a lot of caregivers don't feel heard. Um, and will see themselves. And I've been hearing that from families already. They see themselves in Vivian's story. And so thank you guys so much. Excellent. And for letting us be a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for being part of it, everybody. And thanks for coming to the webinar. It was really great to have a little chat with everyone today.